Hi, everybody. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion about media production. And our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we're going to talk about X32s, the Behringer X32. A lot of us use this as kind of a general purpose mixer. And uh, so it's very common within our community. And we thought that we would um, um, bring a couple people in. So we've got Marty a uh, a Adius and as well as Andy uh, Broughton. And they're going to be talking a little bit about the X32 answer answering your questions. It's going to be a great time to ask questions about the X32 if you're using one or thinking about it. So uh, just throw those questions in right now for the second hour um, or the first hour. You can use Makana, of course, and ask the questions and vote on the questions and chat with each other. If you don't have that, you can just go to askofficehours.global. That's askofficehours.global. You can go there seven days a week, 24-7, um, and, uh, and ask those questions as they come up. But right now, you can ask them, and we'll keep an eye on, on them for you for the show. Let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Bill, what do we have? First one comes to us from Matthew LeCount in Oakland, California. This article is a bit alarming, he notes. How skeptical should we be when clicking on QRs? And he's got a QR code. He's got a link there to codes can steal money and install malware. I go, Courtney. Well, it shouldn't uh, be any more dangerous than uh, just clicking on a link that you don't know about in an email or anything else, because basically that... Uh, it is, you know, the QR code is carrying usually a link to a website. And there are, of course, malicious websites out there that can infect your machine just by going to them. So you, if you don't know, if you look at the, uh, if you take a picture of the link and it shows you where the contents of it, look at it first before you execute a go to it. I think my, my, my phone uh, always offers me you know, do you want to go to this website if it's a destination uh, website, you know, if it's a web browser location that you have to affirm that before it goes to it automatically. So set your, uh, set your device that is seeing those QR codes to not go to them directly, but to ask you if you want to go to it and show you the, uh, the decoded version of the QR code. Yeah, and on, on the, the typical way on, on Apple iPhone to do it is to... Um... You open up your Photos app, point at it, and it will show you that URL at the bottom automatically. So you can look at it there, make sure that it's not. But, I mean, a lot of times it's a shortened URL. Um, it's one of the reasons that uh, when I do, I do a lot of QR codes. When I do the QR code, I show you the QR code. I show you the, the link of where I'm going to send you right below the QR code. Um, and then let you make a decision, and then it should match. <laughs> like you'll you'll point at it, and the link, the two links should match there. Um, but but that that there's twofold reason to do that. One is um, it makes it a lot easier. For some reason, someone's having trouble with the QR code. Um, it makes it easier that they have a shortened URL. I buy those URLs for every event for our clients um, and for the people that we work with. And you ask office you know ask office hours global. You know we 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 purchase those, and the reason for that is that. It's way better for us to give you a personalized one because when you look at it, I can say it, you can hear it, you can use the QR code, but you don't need it. Uh, the QR code just makes it a little bit faster. And so um, there you go. There's the little, there's our QR code. And um, but that the the URL is right across the top there, um, so you can type it in if for some reason you're having some technical difficulties with actually getting it to work, which some people do. We we're a little bit more aggressive about how we use the QR code. You'll notice that it's got a little bit of gray, a little white. That's because we've been testing it with HDR and we found that. All white was a really, uh, really loud um, uh, way to put up a QR code. So we, um, we've we left a part, parts of it white, but a lot of them are gray, and that's really for an HDR stream. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Courtney. Yeah, you brought up something important. That since you created that QR code, you put the uh, destination or what it translates to on the top uh, as, as text. So be careful because that's what a spammer or a scammer would do, would put put up, a, you know, like Google.com or Amazon.com slash. And so you think you're going to Amazon and when in reality the, the code decodes and it's something different. So always check. Don't trust any translation that's provided as part of the QR code. And, and to Courtney's point, I mean, this is actually one of the things that, that I focus on is I, I want you to be able to visually understand that it matches. I don't really believe in the shortened URLs. Like I don't, I don't like the bitlies and the, and the, all the other shortened ones that people put up. They put them up so that they can track them or they, or the service tracks them for them or they have some intern that did it and didn't know better. Um, but there's, there can be all kinds of things, um, you know, and, and if you're building QR codes, you don't want to use those services because 
if you stop paying for them, sometimes those QR codes stop working and then it's really embarrassing. So, uh, so you know, I use a software, like a, a actual application on a, um, on, on my Mac to build those QR codes. It doesn't give me as much creativity as I'd like, uh, but I know what it's going to send them to. Next question. Zach Stallsmith in Chautauqua, New York says, I use NDI Studio Monitor to show the live feed from my vMix instance. My network speeds are fast enough for the production I'm doing, but recently the audio from vMix to Studio Monitor either cuts out or just doesn't work. What can I do? Good guy. Yeah, this is an interesting one. The folks that I talk to, they just wouldn't do it. I mean, I know it's possible to, to send NDI like this through a cloud instance, but it's just, the protocol is just not built for it. If you really wanted to do it, here's a my cloud instance running up in AWS right now. Um, the one way that you can try and do it is with NDI Bridge. What this will do is it'll act as an encoder. So you host on this side, and then you um, let me stop this one for a second. When you when you set up your encoder settings, you can set it up to be uh, NDI HX. So here. You have output, because what you're doing essentially is you're running it in almost local mode, which is no transcoding going on whatsoever. But if you host from your cloud instance and then say um, encoder settings and dial it to whatever your sweet spot is, so this is NDIHX and you could go uh, low, medium, or high, or you could actually customize this by dragging uh, this little thing down here where it says 5750. So depending on what megabit you're at. But realistically, the way that I would do it is most likely just use Parsec or use um, Nice DCV and just go real time with the audio through there. If you're experiencing audio issues, there is a vMix uh, 11 um, video that was put out by the folks at vMix that you may be having some audio glitches due to one of the settings that's in Windows 11 on your side. So on when you're pulling it down. So those are a couple tips is oh, one more uh, bird dog cloud would be another one. If you must do it this way, they have a way of transcoding from NDI to WebRTC in the cloud. So that way it, it depends on the latency, how fast you want this stuff to happen. Cause I don't know why you really want to do it like this again, Parsec or nice TV, just doing it natively would probably be the way that I would, I would go about it. Next question. Next question comes to us from uh, Andy Kokendorfer in VR Florida. Again, is the order of importance for mic characteristics? What is that order of importance? Proximity, pickup pattern, accuracy, max SPL, dynamic range, and so forth. Good morning. You know, I really like this question. Uh, and thank you for asking it because these are really, really important characteristics of any microphone. And they are different from one microphone to another, whether they be lavaliers or handheld mics or boom mics. But the answer is it all depends on your on your situation and your application um, uh, and your environment. I mean, some of these characteristics may be more important in one environment than in a different environment. The, the goal, though, is to find a microphone that sounds as natural as possible um, in the recording or the broadcast for the person or instrument that you're applying it to. And, you know, there isn't one microphone that will sound best everywhere. Um, for certain voices, one microphone will sound better than another microphone, depending on their spectral characteristics uh, and, and the throatiness and, and the room that they're in. Good, Courtney. Yeah, Marty, you pretty much nailed it. It depends on your situation that you're in. The maximum SPL probably only comes into play if you're recording extremely loud things like gunshots or a cannon fire or uh, things like that, uh, or you know, a super loud rock singer who's going to eat the microphone. Uh, dynamic range is related to maximum SPL because it depends on uh, you have to stay within the maximum sound pressure level to record clean sound throughout the dynamic range. Pickup pattern is probably the first thing you want to choose depending upon your situation so that you want to isolate the person or the source of the sound. Uh, so you want to pick a pickup pattern that doesn't hear too much of the surrounding area. Uh, or if you're in a situation where you want two people that could be talking at the same time next to each other, you'd choose a wider pickup pattern. So you, you base the pickup pattern on the number of people speaking, the position to the microphone, and uh, how far away the microphone is going to be. Accuracy is kind of subjective. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you can have perfect accuracy, but it doesn't sound exactly right to some people. So 
it depends on the speaker. An accurate sound may not sound as good as one that is weighted towards one end of the frequency spectrum or the other. You may want to have a little high frequency bump at uh, 5,000 to 12,000 cycles if you're using it inside, let's say, a windscreen that's going to muffle some of those high frequencies. So you may need different things depending upon the type of uh, coverage you're going to, you know, covering you're going to have on the microphone or wind protection you're going to have on the microphone. So everything is. Uh, is relative, and uh, the more sound the the sound, the mic can out, output, the less problem you're going to have with hearing self noise on your preamplifier. So, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, I go along with all my uh, preceding uh, friends here that are uh, making comments. I, I like to call it personality. I mean, every mic, there's a mic for every voice. I guess is the best way to put it. And uh, different mics, it, it, it sometimes has nothing to do with the cost of it. Will sound better or worse on certain voices. Like I've got a U87 behind me, but it's not an appropriate mic to use for a web uh, webcast. Uh, Alex could buy any mic or get any mic that he wants, but he's using a mid-price Stellar um, <clears throat> microphone, which sounds great for him. So uh, there's lots of choices. Ultimately, use your ears to decide how you sound on that particular microphone. Does it bring out the qualities of your voice that you want to be heard? Go ahead, Bill. My colleagues have covered 90% of it. The only thing I'll say is also use case. Uh, I used to do stadium announcing in an indoor soccer arena. The mic I would use there has nothing in common with the mic I'm using here or the one I use in the voice booth when I'm doing voiceover. It is a process of matching the tool to the use case, and it always needs to be bespoke. You have to pick the mic for what you're doing. Next question. Next question comes to us from Douglas Carmichael. Have you ever worked on a production on a cruise ship? I'm thinking it would be more challenging than any land-based venue, considering the high latency internet connectivity through the satellite, I guess, and that it'd be harder to get gear on and off the ship. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, it's, it's super hard. <clears throat> um, I did a show in March of 1998 on a Royal Caribbean cruise. Uh, it was difficult. We moved 33 cases worth of gear onto the boat, just as luggage, moved it into our room and staged everything out of our room. We had rented out, uh, the client I was working for had rented out, you know, a whole bunch of people. They were doing it as an incentives program. Um, I will say this about cruise ships and uh, the cruise industry and Royal Caribbean in particular. If I told you everything I know, I would be sued for slander because I know people that have been sued by Royal Caribbean for slander. Uh, I will never set foot on a cruise ship again, ever. Like, never, ever. Like, think of the way <laughs> Alex you, always talks real, about... How do you really feel? My parents love cruise ships. They, well, they, how do you they feel don't about OBS, about Alex? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing. I mean, I mean, I would never, ever give a cruise industry a, a penny. Just avoid it like the plague. I will, I will admit, I, I'm giving Chris a hard time, but I have a friend that did video production on a cruise ship. Like, that's all, all he did. And yeah. the stories were more than I could handle. No, so, so it was like, oh, so I haven't, my, I've never been on a cruise ship. Um, yeah, go ahead. If you do, sleep with your feet to the bow. They run aground a lot. <laughs> Just like a tour bus. I'm telling you, this is, from, this, this is from the onboard video guy who I spent a lot of time with. This is called ship hours now. All right, all right, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I, I would say just about that. I mean, it, it also probably matters which cruise line you're going with, you know, your, your meal at McDonald's, while maybe it tastes good, maybe it doesn't, is going to be different than a five-star restaurant. Um, but as far as production, a buddy of mine, uh, did lighting on a cruise ship. You know, if you're, if you're getting your stuff on his luggage, that might be a bit more challenging, but if you have, um, you know, this is a production and it's planned out. I mean, their logistics, especially nowadays, is is crazy because they are moving so much stuff, food and everything else on and off because you need to have everything you might ever need on the ship. Same with a production. So you do have to plan ahead. You can't just run out and go buy something when you realize you forgot it. So you definitely need to plan that out. Um, and then as far as latency, I mean, you know, I would think you would never want to be relying on a system for a live production unless you're trying to broadcast out uh, to the internet. But if you're doing a production on the ship entertainment, one of the shows, uh, you would not want to be relying on a system that requires internet access. They're closed systems. The networking for those systems yeah. are great. You just don't want to rely on the internet. Yeah, good, Courtney. 
Yeah, the internet is notoriously bad on cruise ships. Uh, they're getting better with satellite and uh, Starlink, I imagine. But another thing to be aware of, there is uh, heavy-duty radar on all ships. I've shot on, not on cruise ships, but on destroyers and uh, naval ships. And uh, um, I did a whole series of commercials where we had to load a whole bunch of video equipment into a, um, a ship that's used as a launch facility, launch control room. And all of the gear had to be put on pallets and lifted by crane onto the top deck and then brought down through ladders down to the lower decks. And it took a long time. Allow yourself a full day to get gear on and off the cruise ship. Also, when you're running cables, you know, we were running a lot of cables around the ship. And uh, there's watertight doors that have to be able to be closed. If you're going to be at sea, if you're going to be other than docked at dockside, uh, you have to keep all the watertight uh, doors clear of cables. Otherwise, they can't close them and the ship could sink. So you got to be careful about that stuff. Your power is another consideration. Some ships have strange AC, like 400 hertz. Uh, that will have 110 or 230 volts at 400 hertz. Uh, so you got to talk to the uh, chief engineer and make sure the uh, power provided is compatible with your equipment. Uh, because you can run into strange things on cruise ships. Uh, so it's much more difficult. Plus, you're surrounded by a lot of metal. So wireless mics don't go very far, and so don't depend on them uh, further than you can see. Go, Bill. So I'm just going to defend them a little bit. We took a couple of Disney cruises when Mike was young, my son, and uh, they were fabulous, if nothing else, because they're really smart and they keep the kids locked in the middle of the ship so the parents can actually have some time off. And as young parents, you know how rare that is to be able to get. I will say that I did shoot a photo for a cover of the magazine I was writing for while I was on that, and I was really disappointed in myself that I took my camera gear and I tried to shoot something. I should have just stayed on the trip because it was such a nice relaxation and to have to go back to work in the middle of it was no fun at all. But anyway, I, I enjoy cruising. Next question. Moving on to Zach Stallsmith in Chicago, New York. Again, any ideas on the best ways to light an area in a church that is typically dark and surrounded by dark wood and no windows? This area needs to be lit for musicians as well as for broadcast. Go ahead, Bill. You want to stop. I think you want to begin with just the basics. We've talked a lot about three-point lighting whenever you're lighting something, and that is the process of figuring out a key light, a fill light, and a backlight or a rim light so that the subject stands out from the background. In any photo thing, I still start with that idea. How am I going to light the main players so that you can see who they are and, and get them up enough so that they can read? I always want to fill light because if my key light is directly in front of them, they look like they're in a driver's license photo, and that is not aesthetically pleasing. So you're going to move your key light off to the side. You're going to fill the short side of their face with a little bounce or some kind of fill. And then the rim light is critically important because often if they're wearing dark or have dark hair and they're in a dark location, you'll lose the shape of their head or things like that. Now, once you do that, the next thing I always do is look at the background they're going to be in, and can I bring some lighting for the background? background so that I can see where they are, their environment. I want to light the person first, then I want to light the environment. That is true no matter what kind of place I'm in, whether it's dark or light. If I get those basic four things right, key, fill, rim, and the environment, I'm going to be okay. Go ahead, Marty. That's great advice, Bill. But churches can be really tough. <laughs> yeah. The 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 aesthetic in some churches are so anti-technical that just finding places to put lights and being able to power them can be a real challenge. So you, <clears throat> my advice is to get really creative with lighting, right? Um if you so depending on the kind of church and the aesthetic of the church now, you say that it's typically dark, so dark wood. I'm guessing it's an older church. Um, uh, maybe there's not a lot of electrical service. I've been in some churches where the electrical service is 100 years old. It's cloth-covered wiring, will not support high-intensity lights um, <clears throat> without a major electrical overhaul. Um but with LED lighting in, in choice places and, and maybe even getting creative with the kinds of lights, like maybe Pavo tubes, you know, I'm, I'm looking at, uh, I ordered some four foot and two foot Pavo tubes, which are 
similar to fluorescent tubes, but they're LEDs and they're portable and they're color corrective. You can adjust them with an app. Finding good places to put them, creative places to put them. They could even be on camera, be seen, um, and look very tasteful uh, and creative in, in that way. So you can hang them, you can put them behind on a wall, you can attach them to um, a column. Uh, you can do a lot of things with these things. Uh, so really is a matter of getting creative with your with the type of lights and where you can put them. Good guy. Yeah, so I'd also be looking at uh, just a more sensitive camera. So I, I ran into this uh, at our horse, house of worship over the weekend where the PTZ camera is a little bit older and I'm editing the footage right now and I'm having to use some of DaVinci Resolve's grading functions to get rid of the noise and I'm bringing up the shadows. And I'm just wishing that I had, I, you know, I'm used to bird dogs and these cameras that are more sensitive. This is an older Sony one. So I would ask the question, why not just go get better cameras? Because by the time you invest in lighting and throwing them, because I, I was going to, you know, th show you these, which if you want to do it, here's 1500 bucks, get one of these uh, Nanlite 40720Bs, then add this Fresnel, this is a DMX light, so you st can still throw it up there and control it. But uh, Marty's right, they're they're huge, they're ugly. So for like our house of worship, here's the shot, uh, one of them, and it's it dark wood. Uh, I've brightened it up a whole lot, but this is with a lot of gain, a lot of noise. And some of these shots like here, yeah, I would have loved to have had that nan light and just punched it right in. But aesthetically, they wouldn't have, they won't let they won't let me throw the big old monster light like that in 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 our facility. It's just it's it's too much tech. I think it, it, we're already pushing it with the 19 microphones that we set up. We're <laughs> they're all over the place. So I'd rather have good sound and use uh, more sensitive cameras. Good, Courtney. Yeah, for uh, if it's for a single event. Uh, you know, what we use it in Hollywood is uh, something called skylight balloons or air star balloons. They're inflatable by helium, and we've shoot, shot in cathedrals and stuff where they don't allow you to attach anything to the walls or the ceiling. And so they inflate these with helium. They have LED lights inside of them, and they float up to the ceiling, and they don't touch the ceiling, but give you a nice soft overhead view. They make them in variety of shapes, oblong balloons, and they're tethered with just some light lines that come down that are pretty um, inconspicuous. And there's one cable that runs up to power them. And uh, they come with usually with an operator technician when it loads the helium in and inflates it, deflates it. Uh, so if the uh, house of worship or whatever the church is that you're shooting in would allow that, and it's just for a, an event, let's say, you can get a nice even light over the entire church uh, with something like that, a helium-based balloon. There's another one called Air Star that makes uh, emergency lighting that's a similar idea. They're LED lights with an inflatable uh, diffusion balloon that is around it. So it's like a giant china ball, but it inflates and it goes up on a post and illum illuminates a broad area. Yeah, and I've used, I used to own a bunch of Air Stars. Uh, I still have, I have one in the garage. <laughs> so, so anyway, it's not, it's a little one. Um, the, uh, I think it would be really, I think that that one might be a little too, uh, in, in that kind of environment, it'll be a little bit of a distraction. I had this great idea of lighting people for a, um, uh, for one of the stages that we had in the middle of, uh, with two Air Stars and two Air Stars next to each other, um, floating in the air. Wasn't a good, wasn't as good a look as we thought it would be. <laughs> so anyway, the the what was on camera looked amazing. Um, uh, anyway, nice big soft light. I would actually probably go the other direction um, and think about things rather than a big soft light for those. What you really are trying to find is the highlights in those areas. And so I would probably go with more of a Leco Dito, uh, Dito light where I'm trying to grab onto the details on that wood and not try to bring the wood itself out too much because it'd be really hard to get as much as I'd like out of that. So that might be another way to think about that. I don't know if that'll fix it or not, um, but. Uh, yeah, and the air stars are, but the air stars are a lot of fun. One one thing that we we like to do is if you look at the final cut on the Pixelcore site, if you on Pixelcore YouTube, if you look at the final cut virtual user groups, we used air stars for almost all of those. We started off with actual China, China balls, and then we moved to an air star, and you'll see um, we put it right above the camera, <laughs> like right above where the camera could shoot, and so all of us really feel and look like we're just in a living room with each other, um, but the best living room ever. So anyway, so but only with black walls. So maybe not the best of living room ever, but the, the good one. Next question. Zach Jeffries from Spokane, Washington comes up next. Looks, looking for ways to inject time code into a GoPro that feeds an SRT encoder. Ideas? Uh, not a lot of ideas. Um, I think that that might be pretty difficult. I think by the time you spend the money on the GoPro, 
and the and what you would need to insert that S, that that time code, you might want to just get a Black Magic micro uh, production camera, which already takes the time code. <laughs> like so, so it'll it'll take the t it has a time code input um, through its service uh, service entry. So I um, so you you should be able to do it there. Uh, the go you're ask you're starting to kind of push the GoPro into a place that it doesn't really work. Uh, the only thing I can think of is that you might use you could put time code into one of the channels. So if you're just using it for record and you want to put it into one of the channels, the question is is will your SRT recorder be able to decode that as a time code? And that's what I'm not sure of. You know, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention. The only real place to put time code in would be on an audio channel with LTC. And Tentacle, you know, makes a, a time code generator that has a uh, uh, 3.5 millimeter output that puts uh, audio on one channel and time code on the other. You might, if it has, if your GoPro has an external audio input, you might be able to use that. And you could, you could do that. I think you the could problem do it with Bluetooth too, probably. Yeah. The, the, the problem is, is that is it's not really being treated as true time code, and so no, you, you it's, you have, so long as an audio channel, you got to decode it on the other end. So your SRT encoder would have to have a setting that allows you to convert an audio channel from time code from audio to time code because what it'll sound like is yeah, you, you don't know, hear this. listen to that channel yeah. at all you gotta yeah. make sure that so there's a there's a couple ever, things ever. that you'd have to make sure that your srt encoder can do um and i'm not sure which ones would do that the matrox might might do that i'm not sure yeah go ahead uh, mitchell yeah i was going to point out that the uh, ltc longitudinal time code on an audio channel uh, can get very messy because it tends to leak into everything. So you got to get the right level, uh, low as, as low as it possibly can be. And the other part is, I'm not sure what a compression cycle would do to time code. It would probably mess up the waveform. It'd probably be fine. Time code's pretty pretty durable. Um, uh, next question. James Kerslop in Down Under in Melbourne, Australia, has our next question. I'm recycling some old first-generation Blackmagic Design cinema cameras for streaming, but need to convert from 1080 interlace to progressive and apply a LUT. Is there a converter that will do that other than the Teradek Color, C-O-L-R, which is out of our budget? Yeah, the, the, there's the the Teradek is more than you need <laughs> to do that. It's a great box, though. Um, it, it, so it, it would do that conversion. Um, there are some um, smaller ones, and I, you know, they should call them LUT boxes, but they don't. Um, Black Magic has um, a handful of boxes that are basically HDMI to SDI converters, and I think even the newest bi-directional ones may have the ability to load a LUT into it. So a lot of the Black Magic ones are hidden in there, and they're a couple hundred dollars, and they and, I, and even the up-down cross may have that. A lot of them will do the conversion. Applying the LUT is is something that you may need another another step to do. But they have the I mean they have the LUTs, and so it's just a matter of finding one that will do the up-down cross, and it may be the Black Magic up up down cross that has the LUT there. I don't think that the decimators will apply a LUT. And now one thing I will say is that one of the distinctions between the Teradek color and the um and the and and also AJA makes also a lot they have their own LUT box is that they use higher form LUTs. And so so the the LUTs that you would put into a into a um the black magic boxes I think it's limited to 33 for real time. Um, 33 points. And so you may want, if you want to have more complex, um, the, the, these higher end LUT boxes are going to give you a um, more complex transformation between, you know, during the LUT. So just because you have the points there, how are you getting from one point to the other and how many points can you use? So the resolution may be higher on some of these boxes. So it depends on what you're trying to get done, you know, with that. But I would look at the up, down, cross. I, I do believe that it, it ha I think it or another box from Black Magic will have it and those will be in the four or $500 range. But again, they won't have the same resolution and they may not have the same interpolation. So those are the kind of things you want to think about um, as you look at what you're using the LUT for and what you need to get out of it. Next question. David Brady in New York City comes to us next, decommissioning a fly kit, he notes, we in, from another group. Is there, uh, there's a Terranex AV in it. How can he best make use of that? Glue. It's glue. Like it is like, the, <laughs> I used to own, uh, I think somewhere north of 20 Terranexes. Uh, most of them were AVs. Um, de, you know, embedding, de-embedding, uh, cross-convert. I, you know, I put a couple of these, I put a couple Terranexes into every kit that I build. So, you know, you just throw them in there and you'd be surprised. They're like a bag. As soon as you start having them there, you're like, oh, we'll just throw that through the Terranex. Um, you can do things like delay the audio. You can do things, you know, there's a lot of, 
Um, you know, there's some pretty crude color correction that can be done through the Terranexes. Um, uh, a lot of them have st still stores. I don't know. Most, most people don't know that you can do a still store in a Terranex and then switch to it if you need to. And so those are a couple other things that you can kind of hide in there. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, you can use them for digital time-based correction and uh, standards conversion. So if you're shooting, uh, if all of your equipment is uh, basically uh, only capable of doing, you know, 1080i or something, and you got to go into a situation where you got to go out 50 hertz, uh, it'll do that. Uh, so it'll standards convert between 50 and or 60 and 50, uh, or 24 to 25, etc. So they're they're handy to have. But if you find you're not going to be using it internationally, you could sell it and use the money to buy something else because they're about seventeen hundred bucks. I don't think I would. But they, you get, what you get them for used, I don't know. I I, I would I would never give up a Terranex. There's there's, there's certain things like oh I could sell that and I'm not going to use that again. There's no time when I would ever sell an, a Terranex because you just keep on. You never have enough of them. I'm always on like somebody's always uh, looking for something else. And we used to have. I mean, again, like when we did. A lot of press events with people with from different countries. We'd have a stack of these things, converting to everything that we could possibly put into a router that then went out to these these things. And it's just, they're just they're one of the most useful things we put into a into a rack uh, with our fly kits. And so usually we go out with at least two, um, even and we want two that don't have a mission, like two that two that are just sitting there waiting for something else to go wrong and that we can solve solve that problem with. Um, next question. Again, we're off the QR code list system here. Eric Price in Kansas City. Up next, for anyone using the Korg Nano Control 2 with the MixPre 6, do you know if it can map one of the pots or sliders to control the headphone volume? I don't know how to find the right CC number in the control editor beyond trial and error. Yeah, we're going to hold on to that one. I'm going to cancel that, and we're going to put that back in. We're going to kind of... Uh, I'm gonna have the folks. I'm gonna put it into voting. I can't. I guess I can't go from here to the middle row. Oh, um, so the um, we're gonna hold on to that one until Chris gets back because Chris is the most experienced with that. So we we probably should have pushed that one back because Chris was out of the box. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Jim Brooks in New York. I feel as if I'm so far behind on my AI knowledge and use, primarily on video production, but AI programs in general. What's a good place to start and a path to catch up? Thanks. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I would start with Google Bard. Um, they, uh, I'm a fan and, and growing uh, by the day. Uh, they've made some huge improvements just a couple of days ago. Um, they've got a lot of kind of con more consumer focused, getting up to speed using it. And, and one of the things I particularly love about Bard over what you can do with uh, ChatGPT is if you want to use it on data that you already have. For example, you have some documents in Google Docs or you have some spreadsheets in their spreadsheets. You can reference that data without having to copy and paste into your prompt. Uh, so you can have a document and a spreadsheet and then at the prompt you can say, uh, can you summarize what I've written in and just, you know, kind of use more plain English like, you know, my uh, meeting summary report and then give me a pie chart from my uh, boring data spreadsheet and the prompt will do it and then vice versa if you're working in the document you can use a lot of that same functionality in the document and then of course they have uh, some great YouTube videos that kind of just get you up to speed of what you can do with it. Yeah, the um, I, I'd, I'd follow one of the people that I follow that I learn a lot from is Chase Lean on on X or Twitter or whatever. Uh, Chase Lean, uh, he just puts up little tips and tricks all the time. I found this, I found this, I found this, and and I, I it opens my eyes to what you can do with some of those things. Um, if you really want to catch up, um, I would invest in uh, getting ChatGPT. I, I I pay for it. I pay twenty bucks a month or whatever so that I get access and everywhere. And I have it on my phone. I have it on my. Um, you know, and I, I do everything from making, um, I'm making some French onion soup this weekend that I, that I, I said, I told ChatGPT, I said, you are a fine French chef. Give me a decadent, uh, French onion soup. And I just read the ingredients and I got hungry. So, um, so I, uh, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'll let you guys know how it goes. Um, so I, I do a lot of my, a lot of my recipes on ChatGPT. Um, but I also today, I, a couple of days ago, I had to write a letter 
I'm not very good at writing long letters. And so I wrote kind of what I wanted to talk about. I gave it to ChatGPT and it wrote a letter that was way better than mine. <laughs> so, like it was just like, let me like structure this all out for you. And it was like, I was like, wow, I'm pretty impressive now. So, um, so the, uh, so um, having it write letters for you, I ask it a lot of questions all day. I mean, the big thing, the, how do you get to know something is not to read about it, it's to do it. So um, I would, you know, you can get the free version, but I would, I would go ahead and the two things to subscribe to in my opinion, are uh, ChatGPT and, and MidJourney and you play with them. And I just play with them all day. Like I just kind of, oh, I have some idea and I just throw them in there. And um, those are the ones that I think are the most advanced at the moment. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney, real quick. Um, yeah, if you have uh, the Edge browser, Copilot uh, is available there. It pops out this little panel here and I like it because it's more accurate than GPT 3.5. And you can tell it to be more precise are more creative and it'll deal with whatever's on the web page since it's attached to a browser. Uh, you can have it summarize web pages and uh, do a lot of stuff uh, creatively and ask it a lot of questions. And it's free. It's all part of the Edge browser. And it comes in Windows 11 too, as, as you can pop it up. Next question. Paul Buchan in uh, Columbus, Ohio is up next. Curious of the panel's thoughts on Sonnet. Sonnet? S-O-N-N-E-C-T, just discovered the brand, and I've heard good things about the Soundwire and Sound Bullet. I go ahead, Courtney. It looks interesting. I was worried that the Soundwire, uh, which is uh, basically a USB-C to XLR adapter, and I guess there is an A to D, uh, a D to A converter inside the little plug here, and there's probably, it says it's transformer balanced. So there are transformers in those XLR connectors. So it's a single wire uh, connection, so it gives you a nice analog balanced output from a USB-C connector. They also make a cat box, which is a four, four XLR inputs into a cat six. So that, that looks like something interesting I'd like to look at too. Good, Marty. Yeah, they, they became uh, known for um, uh, the Sound Bullet. <clears throat> that was their first product, and, and they're expanding now into other things. The Sound Bullet is a really, really useful and interesting tool because it has so many functions to it. It's like a Swiss Army knife for audio. Um, it's got a loudspeaker in it. It's got a generator in it. It detects phantom power. Uh, the generator has multiple um, output levels and pink noise and sine wave. It's got a headphone jack on it. It, it really tests inputs as well as outputs. Uh, so it's a really handy thing to have, uh, particularly since the, um, uh, <clears throat> the Q box, which everybody was required to carry with them, uh, hasn't been available since, the pan since early in the pandemic. This one is a really cool device. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Andy. Yeah, I had, a, like everyone else, I had a Q-Box for years and years and then discovered this device. And uh, I was pretty early adopter showing everybody, look at this thing. It's very tiny, very easy to use. And uh, as uh, as Marty said, it has a whole bunch of great functions. And, and, you, I, and, I, and <laughs> excuse me, comparing it to the Q-Box, you feel like it can replace it? Yeah, it, it, especially it's it's physically it's physically smaller. Uh, it's rechargeable. Um, it uh, it shows phantom. I I can't remember if the Q box shows phantom. I think the Q box does as well. It does. Um, yeah. The one thing the Q box can do that you can't do on the on the uh, sound bullet is check com uh, voltages. So if you have uh, um, intercom and you've got thirty volts on your on your pin two, uh, it, it won't help you with that. Uh, checking that out so people still use the um the other box for that um what's really interesting though is just, you should try and watch the dave rat video where he takes a tour of the company and uh the attention to detail is incredible this company is so impressive they they get custom design screws they get um the the headphone jack is is isolated so that if you happen to use the headphone jack and plug it into your mixer and have a 48 volt phantom on your mixer it will not blow up the box unlike a lot of other things so tons of attention to detail but you only see this in in watching the video that is the walkthrough so i highly recommend that i love i love it when companies just go we're going to build exactly what we want <laughs> and then we'll just charge what it costs to make it exactly. and people will buy it you know like do, i do feel like right. 
Yeah, like, like you, Sound Devices is another company that I always feel like, you know, like, you know, for the, especially for like the 8 series and the 6 series, they're like, we just built what we thought would, you know, be the best thing that we could build for that. And, and we're not worried about, you know, we'll figure out what it costs down the road. Uh, so anyway, it's it's good. I, I've never, I've literally never heard of Synect until today. So I'm going to be, it's, this is a very expensive show for me. Anyway, next question. Eric Price in Kansas City is up next. For anyone using the Korg Nano Control 2 with the MixPre 6, do you know if you can map one of the pots or sliders to control the headphone volume? I don't know how to find the right CC number in the control editor beyond trial and error. Bringing it back for Chris. There you go. So here's the thing, Eric. I, I, I don't think so because the way the Korg, when you use your Korg to talk to your MixPre, you plug it in. And there's like a, as I recall, and I did this, you know, two and a half, three years ago, there's like this weird keyboard sequence that you hold on the Korg when you plug it in. And then it goes, it like sniffs what's out there and it goes, oh, I'm talking to a mixed premium. And it changes to the appropriate protocol. So there's nowhere that I know of to actually go in and adjust the CC numbers like we did when we set up Alex's system in, in the, uh, um, the lab. So there might be a way, but I have no idea what it is. It doesn't seem likely. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next question. Uh, Danny Grizzle in Longview, Texas. What would be the best way to go about achieving a Dugan style auto mix inside Final Cut Pro 10? I've got multiple ISO audio tracks recorded with tentacle track E body pack recorders that are synced to separate audio tracks. Good, Bill. I'm not sure this is easily possible because I don't think Final Cut was designed to do any kind of Dugan style stuff. Um, Dugan was a live sound tool and one of the great ones that's ever come along. It allows uh, the, the hardware mixer to understand when people are talking and suppress the channels of the people who are not talking, essentially making writing gain on a live recorder automatic. Well, Final Cut is designed as a program to gather in digital assets, mostly video, but it also does audio and graphics and things like that, and then create them into something and turn them back around. I'm not sure that there's anything that I've ever seen in terms of a plug-in that auto-rides gain inside. Now, you could probably achieve pieces of that by the application of compressors and limiters and things like that. But I don't know of anybody who does an auto-mix suite inside it. I think this would have to be bespoke. I might be wrong. I'm just ignorant of this. But that's, that's kind of the way I feel about it at this point. Go ahead, Chris. Here's what I would do, Danny. I would take those ISOs. I would gang them into a, a, a compound clip. And I would assign a different role to each one of those people. And the reason you're going to do that is when you select that compound clip as your master audio for your for your um, your timeline, or I guess they call it a project, uh, you'll be able to expose the audio components and see each person individually. So that's the first step to to to. to Plus, it'll be color coded, and that's always cool. Um, so that's the first step I would do. Then, at that point, you could apply, as Bill just said, a different. And again, this is not Dugan. I get it. I get it. I get it. But you could apply a different gate that you could individually adjust, adjust to the individual person to kind of, you know, suck their their audio down. I will tell you, I do this all the time with like multi camera, multi head, ISOed people. And I just duck them manually. I, I wait until I get the um, the content cut roughed in, and then I just go in and I duck them manually. It takes it takes all of you know five or ten minutes, and it absolutely elevates the uh, the quality of the audio because you don't have a bunch of extra uh, room noise. Next question. Next one comes to us from Bobby Rafferty in Central Florida. Good morning. I just thought I'd share that After Effects now officially supports 3D and the, importion, the importing of 3D models. Here's a link to the December 2023 feature releases, and it's got a link there. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, this is big news, uh, Bobby, uh, particularly since After Effects has, to a fashion, supported 3D models. But uh, they have a 3D environment, had it for quite some time for cameras and lighting, et cetera. And if you wanted to get a model into it, uh, they have a light version of Cinema 4D that they've been using, but very clunky. Um, and you could use a plugin called Element 3D. But the idea now that you can actually bring a model in 
um, is very significant. I'm not sure about the new format of the model GLTV and GLB. Uh, GLTF, is a new, DLT, yeah, it's a GF new, and GLB. These are these are common, you know, kind of more web webish formats. Yeah, and um, it, what's nice about those is that they package the, all the materials and everything all into one file, which is handy. Um, the other thing is they do have an a, a OBJ. Uh, uh, beta, so yeah. you can bring it into it. But the most significant thing about all of this is that uh, they're also supporting HDRI files, which is the secret sauce to making any 3D object look good because you have to place it in an environment and allow the lighting and the reflections and everything to interact with the model. And uh, all of those things uh, are bringing uh, After Effects into the 3D world. Congratulations. Yeah, It'll be interesting, yeah. I mean, the, the the classic 3D, what they call classic 3D, was a disaster, like just a complete unmitigated disaster in After Effects. And, and so a lot of us tried to use it for a little while and we're like, it just, it just ground to a halt when you turned it on. Um, and so this is a, this is a move forward. Uh, it looks it looks interesting. I, I'm going to definitely test it um, and see how it works. Um, see the things that I'm going to be looking for. Obviously, are ease of use, how it brings it in, anti-aliasing. So anti-aliasing in these models it tends to be something that that's what motion has a little bit of trouble with at times. And so we, it'll be interesting to see how it handles that in the models. And um, I'm pretty excited about the image based lighting. Uh, a lot of us have been I've been building image based lighting models for twenty over twenty years. <laughs> so they, they um, all. Also have and a so, new render in it, um, which I think yeah. will help with the aliasing issues. Yeah, yeah, it could, it could absolutely. It just depends on what the cost is, of course, of that render. Um, but it's nice to have it inside of that. The only thing else, the only glitch that I would say is supporting GLTF and GLB when almost the entire industry is going towards USD. It seems nuts. <laughs> like, like it just like now we have to support this format, and, I, and I'm sure that somebody had a good idea at Adobe to do that. But like the entire industry is going one direction, and they picked a different model format. So it was just dumb. Um, and so like that was a dumb move. Like USD is is the future. Not I'm, U, there's USDZ, which is what Apple uses, but USD, which is what Pixar uses, and Maya, Houdini, and everything else. Um, there's got to be, I don't, and it's it's not like it costs, a, it's a licensing deal. It just seems like an unforced error. Um, they will, I will say that what's most likely going to happen is we're going to get a lot of benefit from the fact that Adobe has done a lot of great work with Substance. So the Substance 3D stuff, so you're going to be able to build incredible models and textures and lighting and everything else in the Substance um, packages and then bring them into After Effects. So I think that that handshake is going to go really well. I just wish they would have used a more um, industry standard uh, file format. Instead I, I think of they're getting there, up. Alex. They're working on it. And, and I think that some of the other um, mm. Adobe uh, associated programs will do USDZ, but I know, it's, it's kind of like, iffy in uh, After Effects right now. It's just that it's going to take over. <laughs> like, and so there, so now, now we're going to have to do conversions all the time. Maybe that's the reason they're doing it is to force you to buy substance so you have to convert all your USD models to, to these goofy formats. Um, next question. Gus Libby in Satellite Beach, any recommendations for an e-commerce site for nonprofits? Good guy. Yeah, the biggies are going to be Shopify, Magento, WooCommerce. Um, big commerce is what we're using. It's uh, on the enterprise side, it was 600 bucks a month. So my question would be, at what level do you want to play? Because if you just have a few products, you might be better off having somebody else who already has a site and just uh, adding it into theirs and having them do all the logistics because in nonprofits, a lot of times you don't have people that stay there a long time. So who's going to do the graphics? Who's going to do the site updates? Who's going to handle the merchant account? Who's going to put the tracking in? So automation is key when you're running an e-commerce site. I ran one for 18 years. So there's a lot of nuts and bolts to it. And if you can get with somebody else who can fulfill and ship and handle all that for you, it's a big load off your shoulders. Even at Amazon FBA might be a, a way to go because you can, let's say you get a hundred shirts, you can just ship them down to FBA and have them take care of all the credit card processing, all the warehousing and all of the shipping for you. So that'd be my recommendation. And the one we use on Office Hours is DonorBox. Um, so if you go to officehours.global slash donate, uh, you'll see DonorBox, which is just built for just taking people people giving giving money to the organization. So it doesn't do the e-commerce in the same sense of the guy. But if you're looking for just donations, that's the one you could possibly use there. Next question. Steve Vieroff in Madison, Wisconsin. Up next, can Audio Hijack record audio from multiple apps into multiple tracks simultaneously? Yeah, so the um, you can. Uh, what you would do is this is where a loopback comes useful. You can grab all these different apps, different input. You can mix and match how those are going to work. So you build those in loopback um, as different audio sources, and then you can drop those audio sources as individual inputs 
into Audio Hijack and then route them on on their own to um, to different re um, recording areas. So that's that's how you would do that most likely. And they're both sold by Rogue Amoeba, <laughs> so they both will work together. Um, yeah, go ahead, uh, Chris. You can also, with a new feature that they've just added in Hijack, create a transcript of what you're recording as well. There's a transcript that kind uh, of works. Chiclet. Yeah, it's, it'll get better. <laughs> it'll give you, but here's you the thing. It's transcriptish. You get the gist. You get the transcriptish. It's transcriptish, yeah, it's good. That's, well, that's, that's a good product, transcriptish. I mean, I was like, yeah, we're getting, we're close. You get the idea. Uh, go ahead, but guy. here's the thing. Here's the thing. If you put a feature in like that and nobody uses it, they'll never make yeah. it better. Mm -hmm. right, go ahead, guy. Yeah, we got some uh, high-powered audio guys here in the house, but I was just blown away over the weekend how uh, our guy, our sound engineer at church recorded uh, the tracks. He used Cubasis on an iPad with the RXR18. So with an XR18, you can just feed in all your analogs. So I, I want to let you guys know that for 50 bucks, those of you that are listening, you can buy Cubasis. It's half off right now, and it'll allow you to bring in 16 tracks on an iPad. And it just blew my mind that everything was all named, and you can go back and edit the tracks. But if you guys uh, are looking for a cheap recorder, your iPad is something you probably own, and 25 bucks is cheap. Next question. Next one comes to us from Chester Sweeney in Las Vegas, Nevada. Previously on Office Hours Global, we had a second hour on gaff tape and wire management. One of the greatest of all time, by the way. What about the second hour on the right and wrong batteries for big and little production tech? Uh, Mitch, real quick. I love it, Chester. I'd like, uh, I think we could spend an hour on V-mount versus gold mount. Uh, and then all the other alternatives to Anton Bauer, like Bebop and uh, Core go. and all the other ones. Lots of choices out there. Next question. We'll, we'll put it in there. Next question. Jeff uh, Jeff Cohen, Miami Beach, are on the panel, actually. DaVinci Resolve only offers MP4 versus M4A for audio-only renders. Any concerns using an MP4 AAC LC audio file for publishing podcasts? Um, yeah, so we, we do uh, we do AAC for publishing the podcast. I usually do it at a pretty high rate, so I'm doing it 256 um, is what I is what we put ours out on because I just want it to sound good. Uh, we have you know it, it, it with podcasts you know they're not that big, so we, we go ahead and let them be a little larger uh, and have them be quality. That's, so that's 120. It's stereo, so 128 per channel. Um, but we do the, do AAC constantly, you know for for that or you know. So next question. Next question comes to us from Mitch Hill in Wilmington, Delaware, also on the panel. What are your favorite lights for lighting food preparation? Yeah, go ahead, Bill. So there's a lot of different things. Now, now food preparation can mean multiple things, but if you're talking about the kitchen kind of set, what I always look for is uh, some sort of large overhead wide soft source because you're going to have a lot of close up probably from an overhead camera and those kind of things uh, in food prep you often get that top down camera and I don't want shadows anywhere I want them to be able to see every piece of everything so a softbox overhead that's bigger probably than the table you're working on would be my first go to and then I would step back and I would look at whoever the chef is or the person doing the prep and light them as I described before so that they look the best possible that would be my initial thought. Go to Mitchell. Yeah, I asked the question because food prep can look horrible uh, if not properly lighted, and it's the shadows, I think, that make it's, it kind of plasticky and weird looking. We need to bring somebody on to talk about that. So let's yeah, someone, someone please put that into second second hour. We can find a food lighter um, and, you know, someone who's doing food photography. I know some folks that do that, so I'll reach out to them, but put it into second hour suggestions, and we'll, we'll get that on the list and start figuring out where to put it. Uh, next question. Uh, Nick Stahlsmith in Chicago, New York, again, has anyone used NDI Bridge for remote productions, possibly for controlling NDI cameras remotely or simply monitoring NDI feeds? What are the pros and cons of this? Go ahead, Guy. Yeah, the way you, we usually use it is on a secondary instance. So the instance that I showed you earlier runs my vMix instance, but then I have another one that runs NDI Bridge. It also can run Zoom rooms. And so depending on where my feeds are coming from and where they're going, I'll use that second instance. So the, the hit is, is uh, the processing is happening on that machine because you don't want to use your cutting machine and get it bogged down. So NDI Bridge is in the mode that you're talking about is transcoding. So depending on how many sources you have, and how many people are pulling that because you'll see in the connections dialog box it'll say three people connected and then you if you open up your task manager you can see how much uh, cpu and gpu utilization is occurring so you want to be careful and uh, if you're going into ahx which is the point of it uh it's going to be a little bit latent so full ndi is very fast it's it can be uh like less than a frame or less 
yeah, super, super fast. But the second that you start transcoding, you're going to add uh, some milliseconds. So just be aware. But yeah, we've used it for control. So uh, even tally pops up. So you'll be able to see in studio monitor if a camera is queued up, you'll be able to see, you know, the, the green or the red, who's, who's in preview, who's in program. So it works wonderful. It's pretty amazing. But it does only run on a PC. So next question. Uh, Steve Bauer in Seattle, Eagle Eye, said, Andrew Broughton, what brand and model of headset are you using? Go ahead, Andy. It's a Sennheiser, I believe, uh, HD46. It's an aviation headset modified uh, to plug into a system. I had to create an adapter to make it work, but it's designed for, uh, for aviation. High-end comms. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's that was great. a really expensive comms that it, because the because it had the wrong connector, I got it really cheap, and then just had to make my own adapter to make it work. Do you have a couple of different adapters for different things, or do you? I do, it? I do. It's a, it's a crazy uh, quarter inch style connector, but with five poles. So the <sighs> worst part right. was this was this um, uh, the female connection, which I had to buy, were about fifty to fifty dollars a piece for each of the <laughs> adapters. So <laughs> I didn't make a lot of adapters. Let me tell you that. But I've got one. I've got one to keep. Yes, T R R R R R R R R R. But I but I guess this is a standard aviation connector. Who knows? I I've never I've never been in in a cockpit of a plane. But it was a very it's a very good. It's, it's like the best uh, comms headset ever, though. You know, for, <laughs> or for show or for and show and show a headset. It's great. It's great. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, next question, Ronnie Hossoy, Tromsø, Norway. What is the perfect pipeline and setup for the sound devices Mix P three or six with single channel noise assist on a Mac using both audio hijack and loopback with Zoom and Unity intercom? Perfect. Um, I think perfect is a big, is a big word and it, it still depends on other bits and pieces. Um, I do think that, you know, if you're, if you're using loopback, I mean, I think that you're, for me, what I'm doing is I'm, uh, looping. And I think a lot of us that have USB or mixed pre threes are looping our, our audio back, whether it's system audio, sometimes the system audio as well. Unity is being looped back to the mix pre as is the, and it's coming back on channel three um as is the uh zoom so they're kind of mixed together in my ear um so that's kind of how that's set up and and i think that most of us work that way so next question james edwards in atlanta says i would like to use the insta 360 pro 2 cam to capture audience questions during a meeting stream we're using an atem extreme to stream to teams if i add the pro 2 as a second camera how would i control the view and angle sent to the remote viewer I will say that these are, I've seen people try to do this and I haven't seen anybody do it well. So, so I, you know, I think that you're, you're kind of getting into a place where you're using the camera for something that's not necessarily good at. Um, and so I would say that um, I, I don't know, I know you'd like to use it that way, but I don't know if it's a really great solution for that. Sometimes you want to use a hammer to hammer nails and a screwdriver to screw things in. And this is really, the Insta360 is really good at capturing stuff um, that you can then reframe. But reframing it live and then feeding it into a switcher is kind of getting outside of its core competency. And I think you're just going to find you're going to spend a lot of time uh, trying to get this to work. And if you do get it working, let us know, because I'd love to find out how you did that. Um, next question. John Fisher in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Any tips for getting brand new heavy gauge power extension cords to lay flat out of the box? Oh, I know a good way. Go ahead, Jeff. We'll see if Jeff does the same way I do. Okay. Let's see. This, that'll be fascinating. If Hurry it up. Is. We got, we got, I got to get to the end of the okay, hour. Okay. So I take a giant long PVC pipe and I uh, use Velcro straps uh, along and then on either side of the bends. And if you have enough time, maybe the next day, then you tighten them up and put them right on the bend and, and then you can kind of smooth it out, but you have to let it time and pressure in the opposite direction. Real quick, Chris. Tanning, lay them out in the sun, yeah. let them bake. Yeah, then bacon. coil them the size you get them to the point where they're nice and gooey. Then coil them the way you want. Let them cool. All right, go ahead, uh, Courtney. And when you unwrap them, don't just pull them out from one side. Unroll them like that. Rotate the coil as you unwrap it. That'll help get some of the kinks out. And then put it out in the sun, like Chris said, and heat it up. <laughs> Nothing like putting. You can put seeds out to get you can cranberries and 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 cables. Cranberries and cables. Um, yeah. The the um, uh, I. Uh, do the same thing. The only difference is, is that oftentimes what we would do is take them out into the uh, out in the sun, let them sit, do that whole rollout, and when they're soft, we kind of kind of try to see where they're twisted and untwist them, let them all do it, and then we would drag them into the into the warehouse and let them cool. 
and then we put them in because then they don't have any memory at all. You know, so we don't want the memory necessarily of the co the coil either. So we would we would get them in there. We found that that was the the and we did hundreds of cables like that. <laughs> like oh, you just re regular re pretty regularly. If we got a new cable, that was usually what, what we did with that. That's audio cables, video cables, everything. You put them out in the sun. Don't do it too often because it's not good for them. Just but, don't um, buy power cables in the winter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hey, we're going to be talking about the X32 here in just a second. Uh, coming up uh, the rest of this week, um, just remember that uh, Tony Mobley has his uh, show today at 5 o'clock, so uh, stay tuned for that. You can see more information about it in the email. Um, uh, building LUTs tomorrow, so we'll be talking about how we build LUTs for the, specifically for the Sony and the Black Magic cameras, because that's what a lot of us use, and how what that process looks like. We're going to talk about power on Friday, so how we how we manage power for shows. Um, and uh, when uh, Saturday and Sunday, of course, are the weekend Q and A's uh, Sunday being more focused on introspection. Welcome back, and uh, we are now talking about the X thirty two. The X thirty two is a uh, you know it's been out for it's pretty long in the tooth. It hasn't changed a lot in the last decade, um, but a lot of us use them. Um, I have many <laughs> X32 racks, um, uh, especially for some of our smaller kits. They've turned out to be just really, really useful as everything from stage boxes to um, to actual mixers. I use a lot of the racks and a little less of the, the actual sliders because we remote control a lot of them. And so having the extra sliders doesn't necessarily help us. In fact, makes it a little bit harder. Um, but uh, the real some of the real experts here are, are uh, uh, Marty Atias and Andy uh, Broughton. And they're going to talk a little bit and give us an introduction and answer your questions um, about the Behringer X32. And so if you've got questions about it, comments about it, go ahead and throw those into Makana. Of course, uh, I will keep my eye out for the second hour. Uh, if you um, if you put X32 at the beginning when you go into uh, askofficehours.global, you can use that as well if you're not inside of Makana. But go ahead and ask those questions. And right now, I'll let the intro start with Marty. Marty, take it away. Uh, thank you, Alex. Yeah, the X32. Yeah, it's about uh, 10 years old, I think. Yeah. Um, 2013, 2012, something like that. I remember um, a, I remember a Facebook posting in one of the audio groups. I think it was Facebook or one of the audio groups um, where somebody showed a picture of this digital mixer, first ever digital mixer under three thousand dollars that was coming out from. Behringer of all and and of really all companies. I th and I think that before that a lot of us were using the Yamaha OV uh, the OV O1V O1V or the O1V96 that was kind of our small uh, digital mixer solution for me at least before we had when the X32 came out that was the that was the mixer that it was get we were replacing it with and you remember how much that one cost. I don't remember. It was it was a lot. Five thousand. <laughs> it wasn't. I don't. I don't remember what it was. I, I had two of them, and they were. And we both. I spent a lot of money on them. So we took care of them, but we swore at them a lot because they were, <laughs> were super frustrating for us to use. And the X thirty two was like way better. Um, and you know, a lot of it got got to a point where the software also made it better when that came out a little bit later. So, which wasn't done by Behringer, right? I mean, the the edit software I think was done by a third party. Um. Well, it was published by Behringer. I think it was bought there was by a, Behringer or partnered a with A different him. company, a different person, actually, who developed an, an alternate software called Mixing Station that is still around and is like a whole other level of control. It's great. But, um, so, you know, if you, can, if you can design a product that hits it out of the ballpark at... Um, that breaks the floor for price and the entry point into a, a high grade digital mixer. The X32 was it at the time. These things have become like candy bars. You can find them everywhere. <laughs> Everybody, ha every venue has one. Everybody has one. Um, I've seen them been taken out on the road for portable video shoots and all kinds of things, film shoots. And, um, they uh, they've really done a nice job with the interface. That was one of the cool things about it uh, was that the interface uh, was so easy to use. It's so easy to navigate. It's so easy to find things and to route things. Okay, well, maybe for routing is a little bit confusing for some people, but <laughs> it's possible. You can do it. That was the cool thing. You can do it, right? 
So, um, uh, so uh, Andy and I have been talking about this is going to be a lab, right? So we're going to go through some exercises here uh, to try and uh, lay out a typical show, right? So, uh, Andy, let's 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 come up with some requirements for this hypothetical show that we're going to do. Okay, sounds good. Um, yeah, so if we were thinking about doing an event that had uh, somebody doing some speeches. And we had uh, some video playback. We're also going to record the um, the event. Um, that would be a very simple start. Uh, could add some live entertainment into that, but let's I don't know. Let's start with a very simple uh, uh, setup, and sort of go from there. So thinking about what inputs you need and what outputs. So uh, you only have a handful of inputs, but um, how many outputs do you need? What sort of what sort of signals are you going to be driving? Do you have live speakers, like like physical speakers in the in the in the event for for an audience, or is it just a broadcast, or is it something that you're live streaming? Um, do you, how many video feeds do you need? Do you need uh, or, or audio feeds to video? I should say. Um, excuse me if I if I give things the wrong names because I'm not actually a video person. So um, I usually just hand a couple of XLRs to the video world and and off they go. Um, but they often want uh, mix minus um, type type of feeds where they're where the video feed into the mixer is not going back into the into them. Um, so I don't know that's sort of a starting point. Um, how do you want to address this, uh, Marty? Like do you want to talk of do you want to should we draw something that shows this or what do you think? Well, let's so let's um, let's establish that uh, for any show we 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 want to know what our inputs in are. Obviously, what are our inputs? What are our sources? How many microphones? How many wired and wireless microphones? What playback sources we have? Do we have uh, inputs coming from uh, two-way conferencing from Zoom? Uh, do we have a band? Uh, what are, what's entailed in that? Um, but we also, and almost more importantly, uh, we want to know what our outputs are going to be. Mm -hmm. Are we feeding loudspeakers? How many loudspeakers? Are they front of house? Do we have delays? Do we have center fills? Because each of those might be treated separately. Um, are, are we going to broadcast? Uh, do we have comms that we need to feed program to? Uh, what are our output requirements? Because you really almost... In many cases, you want to set up your outputs first, right? And this is with any show, with any console, this general practice. And um, so let's say that <clears throat> let's say that we have a show where uh, it's a, we have a live audience, so we have two front of house speakers left and right. Um, let's let's start with that, and and that's pretty basic. We do have broadcasts; we are streaming this. Um, and uh, what else do we want to throw in there? And we can, this can be interactive with the entire panel. So if you have any ideas, uh, just uh, shout them out. <clears throat> I mean, a lot of times we're trying to figure out who needs to hear what. You know, like, so it's just, you know, there's a basic show, but then there's a lot of, you know, whether those are going back to the, you know, whether it's going back to the artist or going back to a lot of other folks so that we have a lot of, you know, um, courtesy monitoring that, that um, we, we tend to end, we, we tend to add to a lot of the shows. And do yeah, you, can, do you prefer rack mount or all in one console of the, let's go with the, let's go with the tabletop console. <clears throat> Makes um, sense. One of the things I often ask for is since I'm the video guy, I want uh, either channel inserts or some kind of unaffected feed that's coming to the camera so I can record separately with the idea of a post mix later rather than whatever is being mixed for the house or for another send. Like multiple tracks you'll, you'll take? Uh, I, what I prefer in those kind of circumstances are channel inserts so that I can literally take it out to a separate recorder so that there is nothing from the mixing content, uh, content that is getting between the microphones capturing whatever it is and that recording for me for post-mixing later for video. It's just for clar yeah. clarification, you said the word inserts. Uh, did you mean direct outs of the channel? Um, yeah, what we used to do on, on early mixers is there's usually a channel insert um, 
quarter inch on the back of a lot of mixers that I completely understand. goes around the channel strip and just says, send this over to the video guy and don't do anything to it. Right, right. That's that's an analog sort of uh, a way to do it. Um, so, uh, on a digital mixer, you'll be talking about a direct out of the, of the, okay. of the channel as opposed to an insert because an insert is an internal thing inside the inside most digital mixers. Yes, you can you can send a, a, an insert out and back into a, a channel, but uh, generally nowadays they're they're uh, direct outs that you would be taking. But you take how many? How many would you take? Four, eight. Eight, eight is pretty typical for me for doing something where there may be a musical and then a musical performance, a four piece combo or something like that. And then a couple of speakers and maybe a feed of uh, a playback source off of something. Understood. Right. So, so with the newer digital technology that we have, we can send some, some um, isolated outputs uh, isolated sources to various tracks on a camera uh, to record. However, um, it's often more uh, ex expedient to send a mix to the cameras for reference and then do a multi-track recording separately um, that can then be used to do that kind of ISO mixing uh, <clears throat> in post-production. So rather than inserts or cables out to something, you just give me a, an SD card or something like that that has the individual channels recorded inside the unit. Right. See, with analog mixers, you had a direct out from every input channel. And you could route that wherever you want. With the digital mixers, there's a limited number of outputs that get used for everything. And so on the X32, there are 16 outputs. And you're probably going to use quickly. those. <laughs> that right? makes perfect sense. Yeah. So you're probably going to use those for like your main outputs. And so um, separately, you can send all 32 inputs to uh, out the USB or Dante and record those to a file as a multi-track recording. Would you also record the time code at the same time? Or, or is that necessary? Well, you know, I've never brought timecode into an X32 mixer. Um, but into the DAW. Yeah, you could do that. Absolutely. Is that typically necessary these days or, or do, do video editors just figure it out? I'm not an editor. No, well, it has, it, it's <laughs> it's changed a little bit. Once upon a time, in the early days of video, if you didn't have some kind of time code, sync was always a problem. In the modern era in video, most of the video sources we get are clocked, whether it's clocked correctly or incorrectly, whether the audio sample rate is fixed at you know, 44, 48, whatever. That can give you some timing problems. But I've found that less and less do I need house clock or these kind of things to actually effectively work with video signals downstream. When, as in, long as the signal's identifiable, I can usually fix it in post yeah. and get it into my NLE. I mean, where, where really for us, a lot of us doing live, when we have one long continuous um, record, um, the fix is relatively quick. Quick. If we're doing lots of little bits and pieces of things, then it's really painful and you really need time code. When yeah, we're doing amen. one long thing and we've got, I've got five long feeds and I've got five videos, uh, you know, that have some, you know, have a, a rough program that goes into all the, for, for me, the, a lot of times what we do is we have the program going into one channel of the camera and uh, the and, I, and one of the ISOs is a backup. So, we, so the ISOs get distributed among all the cameras just in case something else doesn't happen. Um, it takes, I mean, we would love to have time code. So we prefer time code if we can get it. But um, a lot of times we are like, eh, I mean, it's 10 minutes for me to line up all of those audio tracks um, and, and get everything back into line. So it's not, it's a, it's a inconvenience, but it's not necessarily when we do it in pieces, if I'm doing film production or anything else, it's a disaster if we don't have time code. So it just depends on what we're, if we're doing lots of stops, stops and starts. So it just depends. So, on what we're so doing. let's take a look at this mixer. Um, because we're 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 trying to do an X32 lab here in yep. just a second while I show you the mixer and get back over here so I can do some zooming. Um, so what's really cool about this is uh, the way that uh, you can navigate around this board um, starts with 
And you really can't see my, well, I can. I can see your cursor. Some pointing here. Uh, starts with the input, input side here. Um, <clears throat> one of the really cool things is that there's a, this button here on every section called view. I love that. that I missed that from some many mixers. Yeah. Beautiful this thing. brings up the entire section into the, um, uh, the screen so you could see exactly what you're doing. It's a really quick way of navigating around the board. And these are all controlling. I mean, in general, these are all controlling whatever channel you have selected, right? Yes, that's correct. So this whole section up on top, um, here is uh, common to every every input channel and and even some and, output channels. And I and I said that, but I, it's probably a little confusing that there's a bunch of things selected. You know what what the viewer will see right now is a bunch of things selected, you know, across there. So how do you control which ones those are? That's um, you know, that's impacting. So if you see down here, there's a uh, there's a button called select on the top of every channel strip, mm -hmm. and on the top of every bus strip as well and whichever one is lit well right, right now, now like for instance in this picture there's four of them lit so you can there's four all of them lit and i would have to zoom out to see what mode it's in generally there's only one lit right um and and that would be the one that you're seeing on the screen over here right right um <clears throat> And then they're under this, well, I'll get to the screen in a moment, but um, we'll go back to here and let me zoom in again. Move over. And we see something right. really close up right now. I don't know what you're, if you're seeing the same thing we're seeing, but we're yeah, seeing I am a game. Uh, but we know we all go. the details of that game knob. There we go. Handsome game yeah. knob. Yeah, exactly. It's well, well made. <laughs> So, so there's the input section, which has 48 volts and, and uh, polarity switching, low cut filter, um, the frequency for the low and cut filter. And why would you use the polarity? Why would you use the polarity switch? So, so polarity switch um, changes the the direction that the sine wave goes on its first part of the wave. So, sine waves are you know they go in the cycle, right? And so um, it flips the wave over so that instead of going positive, it goes negative, and instead of going negative, it goes positive. When you have two microphones that are fairly close to each other, and uh, they're both hearing the same source, so let's say there's two people sitting next to each other in an interview, each one has a lavalier microphone, they're close enough so that both microphones are hearing both people when they speak. And because of the physical distance between the microphones, there's a timing difference which causes a phase cancellation. A lot of times when you flip the polarity on one of those microphones, that can reverse the cancellation and make it sound more natural. And we've also had issues in, in streams where someone has the, the it's a mis mis miswired cable or miswired convenience panel um, where the where one of the channels is coming in the wrong way. <laughs> you know, and so it's it's coming exact opposite of what it needs. And Or it's and, been re even recorded that way. I've, I've seen actual recordings where the left and right are, are out of polarity with each other. Yeah, so we've had to, um, because they'll, in a, if you listen to them in headphones, they'll sound fine. If you listen to them summed, they will not sound fine. <laughs> like, you know, so they, in fact, they won't sound much at all. So um, anyway, go, go ahead, Marty. All right. Yes, that's absolutely correct. So yeah, uh, uh, a bad wire, even some microphones can be wired uh, out of polarity uh, with reverse yeah. polarity. And so you might want to... I probably that. dug us a little too deep into that, into that weed. Um, you know, so uh, yeah. we, we probably have another couple minutes before we start open up. We've got a question stacking up uh, oh, good, for, good, for good, the good, thing. Good. So, so go ahead and uh, show us around a little bit. All right, so um, to the right of the, oh, to the underneath the input section is the gate and dynamic section where you have your compressor and your noise gate. To the right of that is your equalizer. To the right of that are your bus sends. Uh, there are so many, there are like three different ways that you can look at how you're sending an input channel to a bus. 
And, and this is a one, one of them and a way that you can see it without having to move your faders around uh, and without having to move your screen around. So uh, with these encoder knobs and with the buttons, uh, it's a really easy way to find where you're sending and at what level, and even whether it, you're sending mono or stereo. Uh, to the right of that is um, the main mix bus on and off and a pan control. So if you don't want to send to your main output, you don't want to send any input to your main output, you just press this button right here that's lit, and it will stop it from going to the output. To the right of that, we have the um, the display screen, which is not a touch screen, unfortunately. It was, a, I guess, a little too early. But under that are a series of soft encoders and buttons. There are both buttons and, and knobs. Um, and the lower part of the screen shows you what they are controlling at any given time, and they change depending on what you're looking at on the screen. There's... Um, and some of these screens have multiple layers to them, and so um, these two buttons go up and down on the layers. And then um, uh, you can uh, scroll left and right if you wanted to uh, and, and change pages uh, when that's appropriate. Uh, above that, um, we have uh, the level meters for your main left and right outputs plus your solo output and and or your uh, mono output, which is often used for setup. Screen is here. Uh, your effects screens are here. It's really quick for, for navigating around the mixer. To the right of that is your uh, monitor controls. So um, with this view button on the monitor controls, that brings you to a setup screen so that you can see what you're monitoring and... Um, and that also controls the tone generator, which has pink noise and sine waves to it. Very handy for um, helping to align speakers. Uh, then there's your talkback screen. So there's a talkback uh, microphone input. Um, uh, great for a either a wired um, handheld microphone or a gooseneck microphone, which is what I use. Very handy. There are two talkback channels that you can select from, so you can output to two different um, uh, comms channels. And um, uh, then there's a uh, your <clears throat> oh, there's a, also a light here, and uh, for for an overhead light. Uh, and then your uh, talkback volume and your... When I, when I first started getting mixers, by the way, I always thought it was funny that I was like, oh, it's really funny that they have a light, but it, it only takes like one or two shows before you realize why why there's a light. In yeah, you're mixers. working in a dark room, right? <laughs> you need to like, see your board. When you first see it, you're like, why did they put a light in an audio mixer? <laughs> like when you're, very, you're, you're like 15 years ago or 20 years ago, I was like, why do they put lights in all these audio mixers? And then it took one, yeah, one show and you're like, oh, I really need a light here. So there you go. Yeah. So the, uh, the the fader part of the board is broken up into two sections. The left section is your uh, commonly your inputs uh, in layers of 16 channels on the bigger board, eight channels on the compact board. Uh, you can also see your output buses here all at once and, uh, and your matrices as well. We'll get into that in a minute. On the right side of the board... Um, these are your output buses in two layers, uh, one to eight and eight and nine to sixteen. Also your matrices and also your main outputs and your effects. To the right of that, and this is a really interesting section of the board right here. Um, these are related to your scenes that are saved and recalled and uh, show cues and snippets, and I think. That will be a whole other second hour or a whole other lab. Uh, <laughs> it's a really cool way of controlling your board and changing parameters on the fly. Under that <clears throat> is a set of soft controls. These can be, you can assign almost any variable, any button, any parameter change that you want to these uh, encoders uh, with a four-line screen and these push buttons that can relate to the encoders or not. Uh, and then there are three banks 
that you can assign to all of this stuff here. Uh, <clears throat> And before we get too far down the road, we have so many questions li lining up. I think we're going to come back to the tour, but we're yes. going to go ahead and, and address some of the questions, and then we'll uh, we'll come back to this. This is great. Uh, let's good. go to the first. Let's go to the first question. First one comes in from Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. Can you describe the process of using auto mix on the X thirty two? There's a, I think we've got a couple questions about auto mixing here, so a lot of people are interested. Go ahead, Marty. Yes, auto mixing. So. Um, We've got black for you there. Yeah, Marty. yeah, yeah. I know. Why is it? Why is it so black? Let me get there. All right. So ask, here is right? here's the software version of the mixer. And um, uh, for auto mixing, there are a couple of ways you can approach it. Uh, auto mixing is in the meter screen. on the on the console itself in the software it's not um, you can open up any channel here's an input channel and over here you're seeing this right okay so um over here you'll see auto mix x and y and so you can select, there are two different auto mixers in the board. You can select either X or Y for any channel. And they operate independently. And when you assign them to an auto mix, um, <clears throat> they will work together. So any channel that's on auto mix X will work together. And I, you know, I just have to find that here. Uh, <clears throat> and we've got a couple of auto, auto mix questions. Let's go. Let's, we'll come back to that one. Um, let's yeah, uh, okay, go, to, go, go to the next question. While I'm looking for it. TJ Worrell in Minneapolis says, describe the best way to get digital audio from an X32 or X18 into an ATA mini series mixer. And do you want to take that or anybody? I, I, I think, I mean, I don't know how <laughs> to get into it. It depends. So the ATEM mini, oh yeah, go ahead, guy. guy you want to throw something? Yeah, that, this is a popular question on one of the larger ATEM groups that I run on Facebook where it's, it seems like every week somebody has this question because the ATEM mini is except, expecting consumer line level. And so people want to feed it just the XLR hot line level, which is professional line level audio coming out of one of these mixers like the XR18 or the X32. So what happens is you overdrive it. So you need to dumb it down. And there's a couple boxes, one's made by uh, uh, radio, uh, the J radio ISO. The other one that is really popular is the Art Clean Box Pro. And basically you're gonna feed XLR line level in. So you're gonna take the box out of the master out of your mixer into, into the Art Clean Box. And then there's an eighth inch mini plug that's a negative 10 dB, it's consumer line level. And that's just a little short run. You just want it, you don't want it long. That way you won't pick up any any uh, stray interference. So you wanna keep that run as short as, you, as possible. Run XLR as long as you can, line level, and then mini plug for the little hop and that'll get you great sounding audio into your ATAR. And, and why don't you um, just attenuate the output? You know, Is that it goes smashing into it. down. Yeah, you're, 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 the, the dynamic range will be off. It, mm -hmm. If you try to just turn it down, you're, mm -hmm. you're limiting it. It's it's a uh, it's somebody else who's an audio engineer. Maybe Andrew can explain that better as to why why that dynamics. Uh, uh, well, I'm just curious. The mini does not have a, a digital audio input. No, it, it does not. It doesn't even have a balanced input. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I it, it's a it's one of the core like. What? what? <laughs> <laughs> a, we, I, I have an extreme in front of me. I have I my company owns like ten or fifteen of these these switchers. They're great little switchers. It's just that there's there's certain things you're like really like really you couldn't put a little little TA three in there anyway. So that yeah they don't they have little headphone jacks in there consumer inputs. Yeah. How would you do it, Andy? Would you do? Would you? I've never seen an ATM. I'm sorry, but um, well to yeah, go to a to go to a consumer based mic input or, or mic line input. What would you would you? Uh, which I would put an in you... inline pad. I I, yeah. I have these little sure switchable pads that have uh, minus ten, minus twenty, minus thirty. Just put one of those XLR pads in that there. That wouldn't that wouldn't work in this regard. It would be set. still too. Yeah. At minus thirty, it, it's not enough. Oh, actually, yeah, the sure one that that is because it's going XLR. Then you would need a little XLR to mini plug adapter as well. So you right. would need two. Yeah. yeah. 
that that's actually but, what we did for but this just last turning project. the volume down on the mixer as you say is not the best solution because you're still going to have uh the noise level of the mixer is is not going to be reduced um so if you if you've dropped your output level really low you may find that signal to be noisy depends on the mixer yeah. i wouldn't i wouldn't know for sure but the, a better way is to is to pad it down as you say that's great. Next question. So you can come out. You can also come out of the XLR output, the uh, the RCA outputs, um, the aux outputs have RCAs, and uh, they would be at a level that would be compatible with the tip ring sleeve, the mini plug input. They're also coming out unbalanced as well, which which makes it perfect. So a it's dual perfect RCA Perfect for about 12 TRS. inches. Yeah. And now they, yeah Turn you don't off all fluorescent lights and motors in the feet, area. But you can use them, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I, it, it's, it, I mean, we, what, what I, how I handle this is that I don't run any audio through my ATEM switcher, my mini. I mean, we put them into the bigger switchers, but we don't run any audio through them. We just, we just let it do its thing and then we put it, we, we, we uh, re-embed downstream from the switcher because... They have all these great tools inside of that ATEM, um, and they uh, they somehow missed the boat on this one. Um, uh, uh, next next question, Chris Sabato, and I'll be in. Oh no, I'm sorry. Is it Guy Guy Cochran, Seattle, Washington? Here on the panel, ten years seems long in the tooth. Would you still buy an X32 rack today or something else? Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, it's still great value for the money, and it's when something is as has has is so common. It's just a great choice because all of a sudden, if you 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 might be able to find something that that uh, does things a little bit better, but because it's not um, well known, you're always going to throw people in, into a you know they're going to have questions. They're not going to understand. Hey, I, I have a file that's designed for this, but you have a different device. Well, that's that's not that's not great. I, I I'm sure your device is excellent, but now I have to reprogram everything for for your new your other product i i work with bands all the time and they will come in and hope that you have an x32 or an m32 because they will have their file on a, on a usb stick now if you have some fancy other board that's that's great but that means that there's going to be a lot of extra work to to get started so that, i mean that's one aspect but yeah generally it's still a great bang for the buck i, I don't know what they're going to come out with in, in the future they have a wing product which i don't think has really gained much traction the uh, x32 rack i think is just a fantastic little I'm rooting for the X48. X48, just <laughs> mostly the same. Just, just, uh, just give me more channels. Uh, go ahead, Marty. Well, you, you know, there's the there's the X32 desktop. There's the X32 rack. Then there's the M32, which is the Midas version. So if the X32 is a chocolate bar. The M32 is the adult version, the, well, and the Swiss dark chocolate version. There's also, I think, the X32 producer, right? So that's the one that's built to go into a, um, it's it's built to slide in and out of a, uh, of a uh, rack. Yeah, out of a rack. Um, yeah, so that's I've another, another slide. Like we've we've had a couple one. of those. <laughs> the, um, the, uh, and then there's the M, the M30 or the M32. There's one that's just Dante, right? Or just, it doesn't have to be Dante. It's got one card in it. Um, so that's a, but it has no analog IO. And there used right, to be an X32 core. C for core. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and the, used to, there the used to be an X32 core, but I think they got rid of it and just went to the M32 core. Yeah, that's yeah. such an annoying uh, point that, that the X32 core was, it was really a great product. It had a couple of controls on the front. And then they made the, they got rid of it and got the M32C, which is more money less features and it doesn't even have yeah. any preamps so i don't even know what the point of that one is yeah uh, it's really too bad that they dropped the other one they use stage boxes for io and dante for io and it's always controlled by either a laptop or a tablet or both or multiples because you can you can open up the software on several different devices at the same time so one person be can, can be controlling stage monitors, one person can be controlling the house mix, another person can be controlling the broadcast mix, all from the same mixer from different places. A good guy. Yeah, I'm on this boat where it's just a slippery slope trying to figure out what to get because I, I was just going to get an XR18. That's what our church has, two of them. And so I was like, okay, I just want to learn it. And then people are like, well, you're not going to get Dante, so you may as well get an X32 and a card. And I'm like, okay, well, what about um, 
uh, the preamps and people are like, well, get the Midas version. And I'm like, okay, now we're up to 3000. I go on the shoot with, uh, with Noah last week and he's got two M32Rs and I'm like, holy cow. So one for the, for the house sound and one for the uh, live stream because last year they got burned when, uh, you know, the mix was just off and people in the chat were like screaming, you know, Hey, this is too low. This is too hot. Hey, feedback, blah, blah, blah. So they brought two mixers out. And so now I'm like, Oh geez, now what if you need two? So it's like two XR 18s or to, I'm just confused as to what to, what to get. Probably a two X 32 racks with Dante would probably be what would be the trick. But you just 10 Andy. years seems like forever in this world. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Andy. Um, yeah. Don't, I'm just remembering now that the DM three, the new Yamaha is Dante um, and inexpensive and a, a higher, what I feel to be a higher quality product than the Behringer, but it does have a limited number of channels, 16 XLR inputs um, and additional two other channels. So if, you're, if your uh, form factor uh, is is small enough that you, you don't need more than 16 channels, I highly recommend the DM3 because it has the built-in Dante already much cheaper than those, the, the those are like super rare you can't even find them i know they're, they're yeah yamaha is not pushing these things i mean they they've announced them and then they're just not arriving fast enough people are desperately waiting for these things yeah they, yeah the um big. and i have to admit like for the x32 like what what when i use an x32 i'm not um uh when i use an x32 i'm not worry about the preamps i guess what i would say like 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 you know it's it's a it's it's a utility system for us but it's not um a uh necessarily a uh um, something that we we when we really worry about the preamps we're using other other mixers oftentimes um next question next one comes to us from chris Tabato in albany oregon besides the physical connector what's the difference between the xlr and the aux outputs uh yeah go ahead andy um, I have all is a little um, um, the thing that bothers me about the X32 is the naming convention. They use the word aux as a as a uh, meaning a, a mix or a group, but they also meet, they also use it as a, the name of a connector. Um, so the aux and and it's channels too. They have aux channels, so it's a bit confusing. And so the physical connector, yeah, the aux connectors, I believe, are quarter inch or RCA. Is that right, Marty? Uh, one of the out, well, two of the outputs have RCAs. The rest, all of them have uh, quarter inch TRS. Right. So the difference is really just the connector and the physical level. I suppose the level of the signals. Um, un, is are they unbalanced? The quarter inch unbalanced or balanced? No, they're balanced. Yeah. Okay. So would they're they be putting out the same level as the XLR? Actually, not. Uh, and I was, I'm, I'm, I'm glad, Chris, you asked this question because I went to look it, up the specs and, and I was quite surprised. Right. XLR outputs have a nominal output of plus four dBU and a maximum of 21, right? So that's your headroom. It, it goes up to 21 dBU outputs. The quarter inch outputs are plus four nominal with only 16 dB of headroom. Uh, as a maximum, and the impedances are different. So the XLRs have an output impedance of 75 ohms, where the quarter-inch outputs have, uh, their output is is double that. It's 150 ohms. And I was also surprised to see a difference between the X32 and the M32, which I thought, it, aside from the quality of the parts they were using, that the electronics were exactly the same, but the specs are different. Uh, the quarter inch outputs have a, have a higher specs on the M32 than they do on the X32. Uh, next question. Looks like Robin Cutshaw in Atlanta, Georgia is up next. What is the best source for an X32 getting started and for more advanced training? Go ahead, Marty. So there are some excellent uh, resources on YouTube. Uh, one uh, one person that I highly recommend, his name is Drew Brasher, B-R-A-S-C-H-E-R, I think. Um, he has posted lots and lots and lots of helpful information, tutorial information on the X32, how to get around it, how to plan for it. He even has documentation. He has planning sheets that you can uh, use. 
Um, so that's a good place to get started. Next question. Uh, Zach Stalsmith is up next from Chautauqua, New York. What would cause a channel to still send an output to a mix bus, even when the sends to that mix bus are muted and everything is marked post fader? Go ahead, Andy. Um, there's there's several ways to get signal to the, to an output. Um, I guess you want to figure out for the way the way I would troubleshoot that is I would try to figure out where what the actual signal is. Is it is it a signal into a channel? And uh, you know you could just very quickly physically unplug things to, until you find out where the source is coming from. Once you find the source, you could look at the channel strip and see if there's a if there's a direct out to that um, to that mix bus perhaps or something else. So where the source of the of the audio that you're hearing is coming from is is where I would start to to nail that down. Could be a few things. Good morning. Now, first, I, I want to clarify some of the language here. Um, you, you don't send outputs to a mix bus. You send mix buses to an output. Uh, and I'm going to take a guess here that he's hearing inputs on the outputs, uh, even when the sends to the mix buses are down. And... Uh, if the sends from the channels to the mix buses are post fader and he does not have and we're not talking about the main channel uh, which can be turned on and off from the from the surface itself um, it is possible that in routing you can send inputs to certain outputs so take a look at your input output routing as well and Next look question. At your meters. Yeah. Oh, go ahead and go ahead, Andy. You were going to say. Have a look at your meters just to see where, where you see those signals. Next question. Next one comes to us from Douglas Carmichael in, uh, didn't have a location. Hi, Doug. Uh, say what you want about the X32, but it seems to have a very well laid out front panel. What modern digital mixers have you seen with a similar logical user interface? You know, one of the things that I love about the X32, and I keep looking for these on some of the newer boards, every fader channel has uh, a several segment LED meter on it showing its input. So you can see inputs right on your faders. Um, that is a really valuable feature to have the ease of use uh, to navigate around the board, to bring a section up, a channel up, a bus up, a uh, processor up on the screen and be able to control it really quickly, that's, that's really valuable. Uh, and, and some of these features I look for on other mixers, you know, I'm looking at alternates, some newer designs, and I just don't see them. Next question. Guy Cochran in Seattle, USA. Can you, yes, you, actually hear the difference between the X32 or the XR18 versus their Midas equivalent? Uh, I can tell you that we felt like we could. Like, the, I mean, we could tell the difference between the X32 and the M32 when we had them. We, we went from X32 boards to M32 boards, and we thought that the self-noise was a lot lower. Um, you know, so we, we definitely felt like we had a... Um, th if you open them up, they're not the same mixer. Like, it's not just that they have better preamps. I mean, I think Dave Rad actually has a great video where he kind of tears some of these boards apart and compares them head to head. And, and it's, it's a completely different build, you know, inside inside of them. Um, but we definitely felt like we switched over to M32s in, in pixel core um, because we felt like, again, the throughput noise was lower um, in the M32s. Um, there were a couple other features that we liked, but really the from a sound perspective, we felt like the self noise was a little lower. Yeah, go Bill. I it just early in my career, I remember the moment that I realized that I wasn't hearing things that were was actually there until I realized I started using compressors and things like that. And a mostly quiet, but not incredibly quiet mic preamp or microphone or something that had some noise in there. In a standard mix without doing any processing, it sounded fine to me. But as soon as I put it under heavy compression or something like that, those little anomalies grew to the point where I was dissatisfied with it. And so I just learned that in every case, the best quality that you can achieve and maintain will get you the best output after all the other things you're going to do for it downstream. So I, I really changed my practices because of that thought. Yeah, good, good morning. 
Yeah, even though the sampling rate and the bit depth are the same, they're 48, uh, 24, uh, uh, 2448 rather, um, the Midas preamps have a lot more detail to them and lower self noise, as you pointed out. And what this adds up to is um, uh, better, let's see, a clearer, more defined sound, and you'll get more gain before feedback as well. And, and, you know, the big thing for, I mean, I don't, I will say, I don't hear a ton of difference between the X32 and the XR18 from a self, self noise, a little bit different. Uh, we've had, I've had a lot of those, you know, in there. The, the big thing is, is that they're Dante and a couple other features inside of X32. Um, you know, we use XR18s as like little glue, little pieces of glue that we kind of um, plug into things if we need them, not for program. So usually it's comms or it's some kind of other communication or it's something else. We usually don't manage the program inside the XR18s um, because of that. The other thing, and I don't know why, but mentally with the XR18, I cannot get over the fact that you put delay in as an FX plug. Like it's just like delay to me belongs in a channel control and not in an FX plug. And it just makes me absolutely batty to look at it. And so I... <laughs> Can't, I just can't get over it. Anyway, uh, ne next question. I, you know, Danny, I have we'll, used oh. I have used XR eighteens when I need more than eight channels of auto mixing, which is oh, the yeah. limit. It's yeah. the limit on the X and, series. And by the way, that's a huge limit for a lot of us. Is the auto mixing going down to the eight channels? And it's not Dugan. I think we talked about that before. I th I thought it was, but I think they used to call it Dugan or Dugan style is what they called it. And then there was a big lawsuit, and so I think it's just stuck in my head that way. But uh, and that's what you get like when you go up to a, a uh, I believe the QL1 gets you 16, I think is the next uh, next jump up where we, we use that a lot. Uh, next question. Another question coming in from our QR code system. This one from Danny Rohr in New York City. We've used an X32 in our corporate studio for several years and are looking to move up to something that is more broadcast spec, especially in trying to improve the sound quality. Any suggestions for where to go next? I can tell you our next step, although you can't get them anymore, they're made of unattainium, is QL1s. I mean, that's where we went. I mean, our, our step tends to be, you know, the step that we've had in the past or that I've had in the past is getting, um, you know, the the X32 lines, the QL1, then to a QL5, then to a CL5, and then to a CalRec. <laughs> like, like, those are the, those are kind of the the steps of, of as the shows get bigger, those have been how we've stepped, how I've stepped through those things. Um, we go to CalRec, or if we're going to, a concert we're going to digicos um you know those are the kind of you know depends on what we're what we're doing but those are that's how we've kind of that's what our our progression has been go ahead andy even though they're not very easy to get at the moment dm7 is the one to look at the dm7c the and the dm7 full size um the, the couple of things that that are great for for broadcast are that they dugan is not a plug-in anymore it's on every single channel so you can do 64 dugan uh, channels without actually using up any of your inserts or any or any of your other plugins. Um, it also has a broadcast package which has things like luff meters. I don't know all the details yet because that hasn't actually been shipped, but um, they've they've designed this to be a theater or broadcast or live console in a couple of different sizes with some additional things. But anyway, take a look at the DM7. If you, you know, can get the, one, they're amazing. And does the does the DM7 support five one or or more? That's a good question. I really, I don't know. I would imagine if you, if you're looking at the broadcast uh, uh, package, that would be something mm -hmm. that would be part of that if, if it yeah. does support it. Good morning. You might also look at the Allen and Heath ports. Um, generally, when when people are looking to step up from the from the Behringers and the Midases, they'll look at Yamahas and Allen and Heath. Yeah, and I've owned a lot of both, um, and I would uh, I would go to the Yamahas. <laughs> like so, so I, 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 I hear a I, lot of good things about the, the Ventus I, boards. Uh, I, own, I own both as well, and and uh, I love the I love the Allen and Heath, especially the D Live, the little bot box. Mm. And I still always go back to the Yamaha. It's, it's, uh, next next question. Michael Tan in San Diego here with me in uh, the Behringer X32. Does the user input output override the channel input output group selections for physical inputs and outputs? Yes. So yes. what are you talking about? So this was one of the things that drove everybody crazy in the early days of the X32 software is that all of the inputs and all of the outputs had to be assigned in routing in groups of eight. All eight had to have the same group of eight routing, inputs and outputs. But then in a later firmware, 
They found a way around that, and boy, what a way around it it surely is. Um, there's still that group of eight, but then there's this other section where you can assign things more granularly uh, in a one-to-one -one fashion. But you still have to do all eight channels. <laughs> they don't have to go to the same places, but you do have to do all eight in that, in that user section, whether it be inputs and outputs. Next question. On Oahahi, Black Bear Marshall from the Oahahi Nation says, I need a Dugan and just a Dugan will do. How do I set up the X32 for just its Dugan to work with the rest of my audio or as an insert control for the main mix? And there is no Dugan built in, right? So the, yeah, if you, not, if you absolutely no have to have a Dugan, you need an outboard. Um, is that becoming a, a name that people just use for auto mixers now? They say Dugan. It's you know, it's hard. It's hard. Mixer. You know, like I, I think that there was a ba again, there was a back and forth where you know the 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 the, the copyright has or not the copyright, but the patent has run out, and so um, you know, so there's you know, you can build auto mixes that sound an awful lot like a Dugan, and um, and Behringer got into it when they got into it. They were saying it's got a Dugan li a Dugan like mixer, and Dan did not appreciate that, and so there was um, and so there was a lot of push back and forth, and I think they settled things with Dan to keep things happy, just mostly because he's an institution more than an, a legal reason. He just didn't want to cross that in this in in this industry. Um, and, and it's a uh, selling feature for Yamaha to have Dugan actual Dugan built in. Right. So I think the only way to get Dugan would be to use an outboard one. You can get up to 60. The funny thing is, I think I've talked about this before. There's analog outboards that we used, that I first bought when I was first doing Dugan stuff. Um, but there's also a Dante a Dugan box that costs the same as much as the analog, but it's got like four times as many uh, inputs and outputs. And uh, I asked Dan one time, well, like why he didn't charge more. And he's like, because it didn't cost any more to make. <laughs> Which I was like, such a great, like the best answer ever. Um, uh, next Next question. Next one comes from Justin James in Phoenix, Arizona. For an X32 producer, any recommendations for a travel case? Cases I have seen have been for full size and not producer. Man, I think that there is somebody who makes a, a travel case. But generally, when we're getting a producer, we're, we're putting the producer into a rack. So, I mean, that's what, that's what the producer was designed for, was to drop it. It's, it's, the, it's the right width to slide in and out of a rack mount solution. So, typically, when we've had the producers, we've had them uh, rack mounted into a... So, you can put them into any rack if you want. And, and what you can do is you can put it, if you really want to, you can either put it into a, a you know, kind of a rack system or you can have it... Um, uh, you can have it slide out of a rack, either it's its own rack or we have them usually in long high racks. So like a 55 inch rack and we'll have it at seated level, we'll be able to roll it out. A lot of times these producer one um, uh, interfaces. Now we've moved mostly, I will admit, we've mostly moved to the X32 rack with a X-Touch to control it you know, in those environments, because usually we didn't want to force our audio engineer to be sitting in front of a rack. So even though it was built for that, we decided we didn't want to do that. And so by just having one ethernet, the nice thing about the rack is I'm not pulling in and out and having a bunch of IO on the back. Um, that's the problem with the producer is you put it into the rack and now you have to have cabling that's got um, slack to go in and out. And that logistically that we found that to not be a great experience. And so having the X32 rack in there and then controlling it with a with the um, the the uh, X Touch was a much better um, for us. It was a much better experience. Um, and then one of our racks has has a box has um, shelves in it. <laughs> Put it in there. So um, as far as uh, doing that, I think that you may be able to find. I would go to mycasebuilder.com, and I would be blown away if they don't have a case layout with foam and everything else for you. Um, that would fit to that, um, uh, uh, fit to a producer if you really want to take it on its own. Yeah, go ahead, Marty. Yeah, if, if you're going to be operating on a on a tabletop, I would not recommend the producer. It's missing too oh, many yeah. things on the surface, right? Go for the compact. It's a little bit more money, but well worth it. But either way, um, uh, two companies I can think of that would offer cases for it would be uh, Gator, and Elite Core Audio. Um, Elite Core, I think you have to buy it through a dealer, uh, but they make uh, they make cases for for all of these things. Next yeah, question. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Check Andy. check uh, SKB as well. Yeah, it might happen. 
They have a lot of, I think SKBR experience has been mostly they have a lot of generalized cases. They don't customize them as much towards a specific device, but... That's but, what I thought as well, but then I noticed that they have a DM3 uh, case okay. and a couple, so they may be, a couple of, they may be changing their lines now. I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, evolution. There. But but also look at my case builder. It's it's work, It's pretty, they're pretty impressive as far as what they can lay out for you. Next question. Samuel Nordvik in Norway, have you ever had problems with the faders on the X32? Yes. <laughs> they're not they're they're fine faders like they're not high quality favor, faders you know so the, so they are they are um of good value for the price that you're paying for the faders um but it also goes back to why we tend to go to x touches is because we we like to be able to easily replace them without replacing the whole mixer uh go ahead andrew i i see the problems that uh, people have quite often are the motors themselves so the, yeah. the fader will not reset itself or it'll start to shake or this sort of thing um i think if the, if you were to di disable the motor the, the actual fader would probably still work fine and i believe they're fairly inexpensive to replace but that's the the main failure seems to be the motor and the hard part with behringer in general is when things need to get replaced like they work great when they have them getting things replaced and working with behringer on fixing things you should always buy two just buy whatever boards <laughs> you're nice buying buy, buy pairs because there has still half the <laughs> price of any other board exactly <laughs> <laughs> like getting Behringer to fix something, it just takes time. Especially if it's on warranty, it, you may need another one. You're going to need two of them anyway because you need one exactly. to run for the next eight months. Mm -hmm. um, we we had a power supply. There was a, a a spring of power supply issues with Behringer for uh, a while with the racks. And then we had a couple of them that had that problem. And it, I mean, it was like eight months to get those uh, power supplies. Yeah, go ahead, Marty. Yeah, so I've been using tons of these, you know, owned by different people, and so far, so good. I've been, I've not had any fader problems. I've heard of some horrendous. They'll move on their own and all kinds of things. <laughs> I, I, but I, I, to be fair though, on the other side of that, we had a Midas thirty two that was submerged in two feet of water for about an hour um, because we were in a in a storm, and one of our our boxes uh, got leaked. And um, we never used it in production again, but we used it in the office all the time and there was nothing wrong with it. <laughs> like it, it completely, <laughs> like we didn't turn it on. The key is we didn't plug it in wet. So we let it dry for, we put it in desiccate, a desiccate, a desiccation box and let it dry out and uh, for, for a week. <laughs> then we, I mean, but when we picked it up and poured the water out of the mixer, and then and then dried it out, and again we wouldn't. I didn't want to ever explain why that what that why that failed on an event, but we absolutely um, uh, used it in, internally every day, and it worked all the time. Uh, next question. Now, I have had issues with the encoders, the the, the knobs that are underneath the screen. Um, they can get kind of wonky, you know, yeah. and 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 not do what you want them to do, not move. They're also replaceable. It you know. If you can get the part and you feel confident that you can open up the board and do the replacement, you can do it. But otherwise, um, there are shops around that can do it. Next question. Wayne Hayden in Seattle, Washington. Midas M32C with Dante Card and a DL32 stage box. Been using it for about six months. Still can't figure out how to route an output for a live stream feed. Anybody know of any resource? Go ahead, Marty. How about we do an after hours lab on this? Yeah. yeah. We can do it. We can do an after hours lab. We can do an office hours lab. <laughs> we can talk. We can plug things in and move things around. I mean, so, so we, I did, we didn't get to nearly as much as we thought we would because we had so many questions and we've seen that more often here. And I want to make sure we're always answering the questions. And so we might bring you guys back if you're willing and um, open up a board and keep, keep playing with it. Maybe get a bunch of inputs and outputs in a, in a live board and start to play with it a little bit. Um, next what question. Up? P.J. Worrell in Minneapolis, what are the options to an X-Touch for physical faders on an XR32 or XR18? Uh, there is a, I think there's three sizes. There's the full size, there's the mini, and then there's one that's like one channel and a, and a, and a dial. So there are like three different X, we just get the full size ones. Like, I mean, I've played with all the other ones and the one with the one fader and dial, I don't know what it's called, a micro or something like that. Uh, it's fine. I, we played with it and I sent it back because I was like, I don't know what I'm going to use this for. Um, we did try to get some of the smaller ones. They're a little less expensive, easier to ship, but we just finally just standardized on the full-sized uh, X-Touches and we found that they have worked the best. Next question. Guy Cochran, Seattle, Washington. Can you use a Midas stage box to get better pre's into the X32 rack? Yeah, you should be able to. 
I mean, you you can do. We were using them for, um, and we were also using us uh, there. I mean, anything that's going to pass it over Dante, any any preamp. I mean, you could put Neves in there if you wanted to, and you'd have the preamps because that's the most important part. That's your interface before it becomes a digital signal. So anything that you have a good pre preamp, it is going to go through the rest of the system digitally, um, and then come out the other end, and, and it's going to come out as line level. Uh, chances of it changing a lot of quality at that point is pretty low. Um, so I think that the mic, it's the mic that's super low gain mic that's going in that needs to, you know, have the best preamp that it's going to touch. We used also um, the MD4s that uh, sound devices used to make were great because they were these, they were just four I, you know, four ins and I think two outs or four ins and four, four outs. And we would use those for the core, you know, for our, our X32 core. Um, and that would give us great, you know, great preamps and outputs um, for something that otherwise was working in Dante. Yeah, go ahead, Guy. Yeah, I think it's AES67 with an EtherCon connector. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but John yeah, Wallace in the chat easy. saying that, yes, that the, the, the pre's will sound better. So that's kind of another angle to look at this is if you want the, the Midas sound, but you want... Are you you're uh, talking about the, using the Ultra the ultra Net or whatever? Not that, Ultra Net, AES67, which is... Um, AES50. Different. AES50. AES50? Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that... Yeah, the DL32, the DL16 stage boxes... Uh, they have the um, AES50. It's All an right. Ethernet connection that goes directly to the board. It's not network. Um, and that will put those preamps into your X32. Go to and Andy. Yeah, we, uh, Marty and I were just talking about this the other day. I'd, I would love to see an ABX test of the Behringer preamp, the Midas uh, M32 preamp, and then the pro level preamp, the DL30, DL251 style preamps. I'd like to see somebody doing a real ABX test, uh, double blind. Uh, let's do, you know, a real test of that. We'll, we'll, we'll work on that. I'm meeting, meeting with someone tomorrow <laughs> that, that might help us uh, get stuff that we can test. So we'll cool. uh, stay, stay tuned. Andy, so, thanks so much for joining us. I think it's your first time on the show. It was really, really great to have you. It is. I'm sorry. So sorry for pushing the wrong buttons over and over. It's all good. It's all good. <laughs> you brought you brought a lot of uh, a, a lot of, of great knowledge here. So we really appreciate Thank you me. joining us. I'm looking forward to doing it again one day. Yeah, absolutely, Marty. Thanks so much for prepping and getting ready for this. It was really great to have you here. Um, really, My thanks. Pleasure. Yeah, uh, and um, and thanks to the panel uh, for being here. We can't do this without you. Great first hour of answering lots of great questions. We were just boom, boom, boom. So uh, it was really, really great to have all of you there. Uh, thanks to the pan thanks to the um, to the producers on the on the end. One reminder again is we send your questions back at the end of the first hour. We're now getting to the point where we can't get the to all the questions in the first hour, um, and you have to vote on those questions to make sure we know which ones you wanted to 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 talk talk to. Um, but also know that they went back to your notes. They didn't go to get thrown away. You can bring them back tomorrow, and we'll 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 try to get through them tomorrow. So so bring them back, and uh, we'll go from there. So um, so, but thank you to the producers for all the great questions, and thanks to the incredible uh, production team. So we've got an, uh, a great development team that's making all of this stuff work. We've got a team every single day that's uh, cutting the show and putting it all together. We've got teams trying to figure out how to tell you about it and manage it and figure out what we're talking about next and councils. Um, and so if you're interested in being part of any of those things, of course, you can uh, you can look at the volunteering opportunities at the bottom of the email that goes out every day. And um, yeah, thanks. Thanks to everybody. We traveled uh, 65,000 miles. That's 104,000 kilometers. And that's 516 million bananas for scale. Let's jump into after hours. I okay, paused there just to see if there would if 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 if, if, if uh, Michael was going to cut or not before I said let's go to after hours. Just want to make sure. Just to see. I didn't know that that was the cue, but now I know. So I, I miss. I lost my banana again. I, I went to go pick it up and it was gone. <laughs> there it is. Joe, Bill's got a banana. Some guy's got a banana. Hold on. I don't know what I did with the banana. Is that, like is, that, was, is that a thing? We're all supposed to bring a banana. Two bananas you show. don't have to bring a banana. It's, <laughs> no. it's right. a. It's, there, there's a. There's a, 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 moot, a meme in in Reddit. It's like you know people will show a picture and they'll throw a banana in there and say banana oh, for scale. Okay. And right. So we we just we just used it for. Uh, <laughs> we, we took it to the nth degree. We're talking about millions of bananas. So, all right, <laughs> all right. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you later. Yeah.